Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Tarek Masood. I'm a professor here at the John F. Kennedy School of Government and the faculty director of our Middle East Initiative. And it is my extraordinary pleasure and honor to welcome you tonight, uh, which is the opening event in our continuing series of Middle East dialogues. And this is something we began at Harvard uh, last year to bring to this university uh, genuine, candid, open conversations with people who hold wildly, wildly varied, but widely shared views on the conflict in Israel and Palestine, the causes of that conflict and how it might be brought to an end. And some of you uh, I recognize from last year, and you'll remember that we spoke with a variety of people. We spoke with former Trump advisor Jared Kushner. We spoke with uh, Matt Duss, who is a former advisor to Senator Bernie Sanders. We spoke with the Palestinian academic, uh, Dalal Araqat. We spoke with the former Palestinian prime minister, uh, Salam Fayyad. We talked to a former Israeli member of Knesset, uh, Dr. Einat Wilf, and we hosted the conservative New York Times columnist, Brett Stevens. And I would dare say that we learned a great deal from those encounters, or at least I did. We had a lot of arguments. We had uh, even a few laughs. And I would say that we emerged uh, more knowledgeable, empathetic, and most importantly, more cognizant of the profound complexity of that conflict. Now, this year's series continues that effort, but it expands our aperture beyond the war to encompass the vast transformations that are underway in the entire region. We're not gonna lose sight of the war, and indeed next week we will speak to uh, the Palestinian diplomat, Hussam Zumlut, and later in the series we'll speak with the uh, Israeli policy intellectual, Micha Goodman. But we're also going to take up issues such as the economic transformations happening in the region, the political reforms happening or not happening uh, in the region, and the role of the United States in the Arab and Muslim world. And in fact, on that latter topic, uh, we'll speak with, hopefully it's, he won't cancel on us, uh, Ambassador Robert O'Brien, who is uh, President-elect Trump's former national security advisor. But given the broadened focus of this iteration of the series, it is perhaps fitting that our first guest should be one of the broadest minds in our region, if not our planet. And that is His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Turki bin Faisal Al Saud. Uh, um, Prince Turki is well known to all of you. He is the founder and chairman of the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies, which is one of Saudi Arabia's leading intellectual institutions. And as you'll be able to tell from listening to His Royal Highness speak, um, the adjective that is most fitting for him really is, uh, you know, aside from urbane, I think urbane is the best adjective, but the second best adjective would be scholarly. I like to say that His Royal Highness is uh, more in the mold of a professor than even I am, uh, or no, why did I say even, than I am. I'm not at all in the mold of a professor. <laughs> Um, and so it's not surprising that he spends most of his time today running what is essentially an academic institution and lecturing and sharing his wisdom at other academic institutions around the world, including Princeton and Georgetown. What might be slightly more surprising to those of you who are not uh, familiar with the personal history of this extraordinarily thoughtful, cultured, and humane gentleman is that he spent 24 years as the head of Saudi Arabia's General Intelligence Directorate, which is the Saudi equivalent of the CIA. Now, in Arabic, it's called al-Mukhabarat al-Amma. Anybody who, from the Arab world who thinks Mukhabarat al-Amma does not think scholarly, urbane uh, gentlemen. We typically think of harder, harder people. Um, certainly not people with the uh, extraordinary elegance, erudition, and benevolence of Prince uh, Turki. Indeed, the, uh, the Prince chronicles some of his time as the director of intelligence in this new book, uh, called the Afghanistan file, which is about his efforts, particularly in Afghanistan, both to push the Soviets out of Afghanistan and then to come to some kind of workable post-Soviet uh, invasion uh, order. 
After leaving that post, His Royal Highness, as you all know, served as the Saudi ambassador to the United Kingdom and then to the United States. So who the gentleman that we have here with us today is not just a witness to history, but a shaper of it. And we are extraordinarily privileged this evening to have access to his first-rate mind as we strive to understand what is happening in the in, in the region that he loves, in the country that he loves, and indeed in the world. So the way we will do this is we will speak for about 45 minutes to an hour. Then we will open the floor to questions. I have been instructed by my overlords to remind everyone that this event is being recorded and live streamed. I've also been given some text to read about how we will handle possible protests, but looking at the beatific faces of this extraordinary crowd, I know there will be no protest, not just because they're wonderful people, but because your royal highness is unprotestable. Um, so, so please join me in welcoming back to Harvard University, his royal highness, Prince Turki bin Faisal Al Saud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Your Royal Highness, I'd like us to talk about three broad things before we open it up to uh, our uh, highly intelligent audience. So, the first uh, issue I'd like us to talk about is the war in Gaza, uh, or what Israel is calling a war on seven fronts. Uh, I think I could name all the fronts. Um, then I'd like us to talk about the U.S.-Saudi relationship and particularly how it might evolve under uh, President Trump. And then finally, I'd like us to talk about developments in Saudi Arabia, the momentous changes that have been put in uh, place by uh, the Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman. So I hope that set of topics is agreeable to your highness. So let, let, let us dive in. So we are now 13 months into after Hamas murdered more than 1,200 Israelis, more than two-thirds of whom were civilians, and took more than 200 hostages. And in response, Israel's military campaign to eradicate Hamas has killed 45,000 civilians, by some estimates, displaced many multiples of that, and uh, has so far resulted in 3,000 Lebanese deaths and much more one expects to come. Do you think Benjamin Netanyahu is committing genocide? Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, I must preface all my remarks by saying that I am not in the Saudi government. So I do not speak for them. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it's, uh, I've had experience in the past. And I think I can honestly say that talking to audiences like yourselves is not only daunting, but uh, sometimes even uh, nerve-making, uh, in the sense that being in this institution and with such a high degree of many of you IQs, um, I feel a bit humbled uh, to be the one who is addressing you instead of listening from you. So uh, Tariq Masoud has been more than generous in uh, giving me the opportunity to meet many of the uh, intellectually inspiring, um, I can say, icons of, of, of professorship in, in this institution, and I thank him for that. And I thank some of them who are here already for giving me the time to listen to me and, and just uh, be present while I am uh, telling you my view of what is happening in our part of the, of the world. And uh, Tariq Masoud is right. Yani the, the, uh, my view on, on Gaza is, is that um, the, the killing has to stop. Uh, and uh, I, would, I will not go into who did this and who did that uh, to each other. But it's a long history and a, a, a path uh, that over the years, many decades of, of, uh, of conflict uh, that have led to literally thousands of people being killed, and as Tariq Masoud said, um, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people being displaced as a result of the, of the conflict there. And I think for the world to sit by and allow for that amount of killing to continue and displacement to be taking place um, is... is uh, I would give it a criminal uh, um, uh, uh, 
criminal uh, uh, indictment uh, of the uh, way that uh, this awful tragedy is, is being neglected to continue uh, at the present rate that it is doing. And I've said many times that uh, what we need there is uh, 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 on both sides, not just the Israelis, but also the Arab side, is say enough is enough. And to turn to hopefully um, wiser heads and, and more capable uh, leadership around the world uh, to bring to an end this cycle of, of tit for tat and death for death and destruction for, for destruction. It serves nobody's purpose other than to cause more, uh, disheart, most, more, more uh, heartfelt sorrow and, and anguish and, and anger, uh, and leads even uh, to more anger and extremism and, and violence uh, as it continues. So this is how I view the situation in, um, in Gaza, and I hope that uh, President Trump now, he has, uh, in his campaign, I've heard him many times say that he wants to bring peace uh, to the world. And I hope he will keep in mind that the, the particularly the, the Gaza situation uh, is, is not only due for peace, but uh, it should have had peace years ago instead of uh, not having it at, at the moment, and definitely not continuing at the present rate, if not even a lesser rate of, of, of uh, killing and destruction. Your Royal Highness, an Israeli might respond, or a defender, rather, of Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, uh, strategy might respond and say, um, yes, the humanitarian cost of this war has been massive. However, uh, Hamas, as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia well knows, is the bearer of an extremist ideology. It must be eradicated. It's not just good for Israel. It's good for the Palestinians. It's good for the entire region. And unfortunately, the only method of eradicating them will necessarily have uh, a high uh, human cost because it hides among the civilian population. I do not accept that. Um, in the sense that uh, within the Israeli political leadership, there are those who espouse extreme views, not just of uh, how to deal with the Palestinians, but also uh, the aggrandizement of what, in their view, is a God-given license, not only to acquire more territory in our part of the world, uh, but also, as Mr. Netanyahu has quoted himself, using biblical terminology. The issue of, of killing and destruction is part of that uh, fringe in the, in the Israeli leadership. So um, would it be a question to ask the, the Hamas uh, uh, terrorist group, and, and it is considered a terrorist group in Saudi Arabia, that they justify their killing of the Israelis by pointing to these uh, extremists in Israel and saying they also deserve death. I don't think so. Uh, and I don't think that uh, uh, there should be any justification for any civilian killing. I recognize in any war and so on that there is collateral damage. Um, all wars bring that. But this particular um, method that the, the, the Israeli armed forces have used, carpet bombing of, of districts and, and, and neighborhoods, in various towns of, of, of Gaza. Uh, and uh, if, they, if they use modern techniques, as we hear uh, written in the, uh, written, read, written in the papers and hear on television and so on, that they're so sophisticated in their use of technology that they can identify uh, a terrorist with a, within a group of, of 10 or 15 people walking in the street or in a demonstration and so on, well, I think they could also be more careful about how they use their, their military superiority the way that it is, um, w with less infliction on civilian casualties. Um, they, uh, for example, they say that 
um, in the tunnels, as they say, under hospitals and under mosques and under uh, so on, there are Hamas fighters. Well, I don't think you should bomb the mosque and, and, the, and the school to get the Hamas fighters. I think you should go in the tunnels and get them in there. Uh, that is a view that I'm sure others will dispute. But that kind of consideration, I think, should be given by the leadership in Israel to how they deal with whoever is inflicting harm uh, on them, not just in Gaza, but uh, in the West Bank, for example. Nobody uh, in, the, in the refugee camps in the West Bank, there is no talk about tunnels like there is in Gaza. And yet we see uh, the Israeli uh, armed forces using extraordinary force, tanks and, and other uh, war-making machines uh, to invade whole neighborhoods in, uh, in, in the West Bank and destroy them. That causes more civilian uh, uh, casualties. So they should be more targeted in their, in their dealing with the so-called terrorists that they want to eradicate than to allow for the, what is it, for, you said 45,000. That is an estimate. That, that's an estimate from the Ministry of Health in Gaza, which is Hamas controlled. So whenever I cite that statistic to Israelis, they say that, that could be even an overestimate. Well, it could be, it could be, but my view is even one death on both sides is not worth the destruction that is taking place. There is a verse in the Quran which says um, uh, the death of an innocent person or, or the killing of an innocent person is like killing all of mankind. And that is, uh, that is the attitude that I think um, a state with a recognition as Israel has in the world um, should take into consideration, unlike a terrorist group. A terrorist group to them, they don't care how many people they kill. So, so uh, in, interestingly, that uh, verse that your highness mentioned is also in the Jewish tradition. Um, what, how would you respond to someone who says to your highness that the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is not in a position to criticize Israel's conduct of the war in Gaza, given the human cost of the kingdom's war in Yemen, which was similarly indiscriminate, mounted from the air, and resulted in massive uh, civilian And casualties. I would say, as I mentioned before, that the, 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 the collateral damage happens in all wars, but the kingdom has stopped the fight. It is not continuing on a daily basis to kill Yemenis, yeah. whatever side it is, because it doesn't want to, to be in that position where it can be accused of, as you said, indiscriminate bombing, et cetera, et cetera. So your highness has spoken movingly and eloquently, uh, including in a, in a uh, widely circulated speech at Rice University shortly after the uh, onset of this war last year about the human toll of the war in Gaza. And given your highness's belief in the unacceptable scale of the human casualties, why has your country been so passive in its response to Netanyahu's conduct of the war. In 1973, your late father, uh, King Faisal, the third king of Saudi Arabia, was so uh, moved uh, it, by anger at the United States' support of Israel in its wars with the Arab states that he coordinated an oil embargo against the United States due to its support of Israel. And at that time, nobody was accusing Israel of doing anything uh, even in the neighborhood of genocide. Israel is just in a war with its neighbors. So not only is your country not doing an oil embargo now, but you have informal relations with Israel, and if press reports are to believe, be believed, uh, Saudi Arabia is slowly pursuing normalization with the state of Israel. So can you help us understand this? Well, your question leads to several answers. Um, one of them is that the kingdom is not pursuing at the moment any normalization talks with Israel because of the, of the war in Gaza. And uh, the, uh, the orchestration of the so-called uh, normalization talks between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Israel was at the hands of the American administration. When we were talking to the American administration of establishing a firmer linkage, if you like, between the two countries 
so that uh, we would be sure that when we face issues of a foreign invasion or something like that, that America would be with us and vice versa, the kingdom will be with America when it needs uh, Saudi support, whether uh, military or civilian or uh, in, in whatever form, etc. It's a reciprocal re uh, relationship. Um, uh, the, the throwing in of the normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel occurred at the request of the United States. And the kingdom's response to that was that we must have a Palestinian state in place before we can talk about normalization with Israel. Why? Because we've seen that those countries that did normalize with Israel, starting with Egypt, in 1978-79 and going through Jordan and then um, President Trump's uh, so-called Abrahamic uh, uh, talks and uh, uh, events uh, when he was uh, in the presidency um, hasn't, has, it hasn't led to, to a stoppage of the, of the killing. Uh, and uh, the Palestinian people uh, continued to suffer in spite of the normalization between Israel and all these Arab countries. And the kingdom would like to see an end to that uh, cycle, as I said, of violence, etc. Uh, and uh, if it is, and that is why it offered the Arab Peace Initiative back in 2002. And before that, the Fahad Peace Plan, which unfortunately, neither of which were accepted by Israel. And the, 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 the Arab peace plan talks about normalization with, uh, with, uh, with Israel as a, a, a consequence of uh, an Israeli-Palestinian agreement on peace and, a, mm -hmm. and a, a state for, for, for Israel. So that's one part of an answer to your question. Can, can I just ask a let, clarification? Let me just continue the other so that I don't lose my uh, um, train of thought. Uh, the other one, of course, on, on the embargo. In, in 1973, uh, uh, the United States imported, I think, over one and a half million barrels of oil from Saudi Arabia. And uh, the share of OPEC uh, uh, oil production at the time uh, was over 50% of world oil production. Um, uh, the uh, Arab portion of OPEC was more than 70% than, than of the OPEC production at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, nowadays, the United States is the leading producer of oil. So any embargo on the United States uh, will have no impact as it did in 1973. Uh, there will be those, of course, who say that, of course, well, if there is a, um, a stoppage of production of oil by Saudi Arabia and other countries in the area, like happened in 1973, that inflation will, will become uh, so high that the economies of all of the world will be affected and so on, but so will the economies of the oil producers. That was true in 73, but you deemed really. the cause in important 19, enough. In 1973, actually, and some oil producers uh, made more for, for their oil because of the scarcity of the, of the oil and selling to other customers. And so that is something that uh, must be also taken into, into consideration. Uh, there are oil experts here, His Excellency, uh, our economic professor here can give you a better answer than me uh, on that issue. But uh, my view is that uh, an embargo uh, these days will not be as effective as it was uh, in 1973. That's what the second portion of your question. The third portion about Saudi Arabia doing something. Mm. Saudi Arabia is leading not just the Arab world, but the Muslim world and the Europeans in trying to establish uh, the two-state solution for the Arab-Israeli dispute. Uh, if you look at the diplomatic uh, activity of the kingdom, it expands all around the globe. And uh, the, uh, the, the delegations representing several countries, most recently at the United Nations General Assembly, the coalition that was formed, headed by Saudi Arabia and Norway, uh, to uh, bring to fruition a two-state solution is an example of what Saudi Arabia is doing uh, 
in order to achieve that objective. And it is not sitting on its backside and uh, watching uh, the, the killing and doing nothing. So, so Your Highness, I, I, I'm going to uh, um, stipulate that everything you say is right and e everything that I say is, uh, uh, is uh, what comes from ignorance. So I will accept Your Highness's uh, claim that, in fact, no, Tariq, Saudi Arabia is doing quite a lot to end the war in uh, Gaza. I, I, I think I, I would just disagree that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has stipulated that a Palestinian state must be established. My understanding is the precise language is irrevocable steps towards a Palestinian state are necessary. Read what Prince Mohammed bin Salman said in his speech to the uh, Shura Council just a month ago. Yeah. Which he said, an establishment of a Palestinian state with its capital in Jerusalem yeah. is the way to get normalization with Israel. So, so, so let, let, let's leave aside normalization for, for a second. So there, there's an alternative hypothesis about relative Saudi inaction. You, you have said, no, Tark, there is no Saudi inaction. So I will flip the question a little bit. So I will accept that Saudi Arabia is doing a lot to try to end this war, and has been doing a lot to try to end this war since October 8th, 2023. That, that would be your highness's... No, uh, I what? would say that Saudi Arabia has been doing a lot since 1948. Fantastic. <laughs> Fanta even, even better. Even better. Even better. So, so, your highness, I guess the question somebody might ask is, well, wait a minute. Why, would, why should Saudi Arabia want to pressure the Israelis to end this war. Let's look at the state of play now, a year after October 7th. Yahya Sinwar is dead. Hamas, which Your Highness has said is a terrorist group, is essentially decimated. Uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, is dead. Several of Hezbollah's top leadership have been killed in a stunning Israeli operation. Israel has even taken the war to your country's great rival, Iran, which is now feeling the squeeze and has its proxy network under a great deal of pressure. So how would you respond to somebody who says, there is no greater servant of the Saudi national interest than Benjamin Netanyahu? And how many other Palestinians and Lebanese have been killed since then? Not just Sinwar and, and Nasrallah. But as you said, 45,000 by estimates in, in Palestine, more than 3,000 in, in, in Lebanon. Is it worth for Saudi Arabia to, to enter into any normalization with Israel while it is continuing to commit this carnage and this destruction of, of human life, innocent human life? Look at how many children were, were killed. And look at the consequences of the killing of those children and the orphan making of those who have lost their mothers and their fathers and so on. Their goal, I would dare say, not all of them, but at least if, you know, some of them will, will, will be the next Sinwars and the next Nasrallah. So you're not ending the, the cycle of, 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 of violence um, by killing Sinwar and, and uh, there are others that will take their place. And who are going to be their targets? They feel so aggrieved, and I would imagine that anybody losing their parents in the way that they have been killed in Palestine and Lebanon recently through bombing or through uh, explosives of some, or through sniper fire or whatever, will bear in their heart a willing, uh, not just a willingness, but, but uh, a well of, of, of anger and, and, and revenge-seeking that you and I cannot estimate because we, our parents were not, weren't dead with that way. So those are the ones who are going to be the next Sinwars and the next Nasrallahs and the other mischievous and miscreants who is going to uh, attack not just American citizens somewhere, but Saudi citizens and other victims in the world. When you say to the Israelis, end the war, do you mean just end the war in Gaza or end the war on all of its fronts? Uh, everybody. I, I, I don't want to see killing in any part of our world. Period. When you saw the killing of Hassan Nasrallah, a part of you as the former head of the Saudi Directorate of General Intelligence did not think that was a good thing for your country? Well, as I said, the, the, the disappearance of Hassan Nasrallah is not going to end 
the, the, the violence nor the mischief that Hassan Nasrallah caused not only to Saudi Arabia but to others in the world. They won't be deterred? What? Has Hezbollah won't be deterred now knowing? Well, I'm sure it will be deterred. Which is good. Yeah, but then what happens five years from now? What happens 10 years from now? All these Lebanese orphans and, and victims of, of uh, been driven out of, of their homes and, and livelihoods and so on, they will turn to be similar to Hassan Nasrallah. So, so your highness, you, you uh, let's talk about ending the war in Gaza. So we have I a sign here, by the way. Th that's fine. <laughs> Eliminate those signs. Never show me a sign like that again. Okay. So, <laughs> so, 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 so the the um, the uh, Israelis will tell you that to end the war uh, in Gaza. Netanyahu would love to do that, but they are concerned about post-conflict governance in Gaza. And what the Israelis would ideally love, or at least sensible Israelis would ideally love, is not to reoccupy Gaza, but to hand this, the administration of this territory over to a quote-unquote Arab force that would be led by the kingdom, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, and they would impose order, help the rebuilding of Gaza. They would own this uh, territory. The Saudis have been very reluctant to do that. And that's part of why some Israelis will say this part of the conflict, the part of the conflict in Gaza has been so difficult to end. So why won't Saudi Arabia commit to coming in and helping uh, re-establish order in Gaza if that is going to end the bloodshed against which your highness has spoken so eloquently. I wish you were right about Netanyahu's concern for the day after, and which I believe is not. He's more concerned of not going to jail once there is peace in, uh, between uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians. So his, uh, his, uh, uh, his wishes and his ideas are not as... as uh, um, morally high as uh, are portrayed by some people, you know, he's concerned about what's going to happen to the people in Gaza and so on. That's oh, one aspect. I'm not saying that. But what? Yeah. Not you, but they are saying that. Um, and so uh, I, I give no, uh, no credence or, or credibility uh, to anything that comes out of Netanyahu. Uh, he is, in my view, a criminal who deserves to be put in court and convicted, not just of genocide, but of other things. He failed his own people. He was the main financier of, of, uh, of uh, uh, the so-called terrorist Hamas groups by allowing Qatar to send uh, money to Hamas. Through whom? Through Israeli banks. Now, he should be brought to trial by the Israeli people because it was his enablement of Hamas that allowed Hamas to do what it did. That's one aspect. Um, the other aspect, of course, whether Saudi Arabia and others, I think the whole issue should be dealt with on a worldwide basis and not just an issue of one country or another country. I think there should be um, a world uh, uh, commitment through the United Nations. It is the only international organization that is available in spite of its... Uh, lackings in spite of its uh, weaknesses, etc., uh, through which a, a consortium of world powers uh, will come in the day after, uh, not only to maintain peace, but also to reconstruct, um, uh, not only in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. And I have recently been pro uh, also promoting the idea that uh, part of that UN setup would be an article to come out in a United Nations Security Council resolution barring anybody on the side of the Palestinians and the Israelis who does not accept a two-state solution from being in the negotiations for a two-state solution. Uh, that way, anybody... That excludes most Palestinians and most Israelis. Well, so be it. But, you know, a mechanism should be, uh, should be put in place um, in order to get... Uh, only those who are committed to the principle of peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis uh, to be party to the, uh, to the negotiations. 
Uh, the other party, of course, the other part I would I would recommend also is the establishment of an international fund uh, to be contributed to by the world community in general, including Israel, for the reconstruction of uh, of, of what happened in in, in Gaza and, and 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 the West Bank, and even some of the kibbutzim that were destroyed by Hamas mm -hmm. uh, in the first onslaught that Hamas committed on 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 those kibbutz. So uh, this is what I would recommend. And I hope that whoever is listening, and he will, uh, will take that into consideration. Are, is your highness optimistic that the Trump administration will succeed where the Biden administration hadn't? I hope so. Yeah. And he, uh, I've heard Mr. Trump describing uh, Mr. Netanyahu as a man who does not want peace in the Middle East. Whereas he described Mahmoud Abbas, for example, as a man who wanted peace between Israel and the Palestinians. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that Mr. Trump has publicly said that he was stabbed in the back by Mr. Netanyahu when they had agreed to together on an operation to get rid of General Soleimani. And at the last minute, uh, Mr. Netanyahu backed down. So uh, I think there is uh, something there that between Mr. Trump and Mr. Netanyahu that uh, gives me hope that uh, Mr. Uh, Trump will not accept anything that Mr. Netanyahu tells him, mm. except to get a peace settlement with, uh, with the Palestinians. So, Your Highness, we could talk a, a lot more about this uh -huh. uh, important conflict, but I do want to just, before I turn it over to our audience, we end at 6.30, so we have time. Um, I wanted to ask Your Highness, uh, uh, redirect our conversation now to talking about the American-Saudi relationship. And so, you know, it isn't a, a, a secret that the relations between uh, the kingdom and the United States under the Biden administration at least started off on the wrong foot. Uh, President Biden came into office saying that he was going to turn Saudi Arabia into a pariah. I've been reading uh, Bob Woodward's new book, and he uh, 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 tells a, a story where Anthony Blinken refers to uh, the crown prince of your country, Mohammed bin Salman, as nothing more than a spoiled child. In contrast, President Trump has made no secret of his warm feelings towards the kingdom and towards its leadership. You have, Your Highness has just mentioned the uh, the possibility of a security guarantee from the United States, along with American support for a Saudi nuclear program. These are things that Saudi Arabia has been seeking. Do you think now, under President Trump, your country is more likely to get those things? Well, first of all, let me start by saying I don't believe everything that Mr. Woodward writes. Um, mm. uh, I, I compare him, as a matter of fact, and my Arab interlocutors will understand it, to uh, Mohammed Hassanin Haikal in Egypt, um, who had a knack to invent stories uh, and, and um, with, a, with, with, a, with a acceptance by others that they are historical fact. Uh, I don't accept everything that Mr. Woodward writes as being, um, being uh, Factual. true. Uh, that's one aspect. But uh, you're right, Danny. With Mr. Uh, Obama, let me remind us, the first Trump administration. Do you remember the, in the campaign before that uh, Mr. Trump came to power? He was talking about Saudi Arabia in very negative terms. Um, you know, and, and, and yet when he came to, to the presidency and having been um, briefed and, and became more aware of what Saudi Arabia and, and, and the American relationship with it meant and so on, um, changed his view, and Saudi Arabia was the first destination of his trip as, uh, as president. Same with Mr. Biden. Uh, Mr. Biden came, as you said, intending to uh, make Saudi Arabia a pariah in, in, in the world, and yet, as he is leaving office today, he is talking with us on a, on a security agreement and other cooperation in the field, and you heard well, was it, was it uh, uh, Chatham House Rules the first day we had with Hochstein or? Oh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> well, now that I let the bag, the bag out of the, the cat out of the bag, and we heard recently from an American official that, 
that uh, the Saudi-American relationship is the best that it's ever been. So uh, and this has been the case. Yeah. You know, one of the things that is startling in this election is that the name of Saudi Arabia never came up in the campaign. Mm. But if you like, you look at previous uh, campaigns, and yani all the way back to uh, Nixon times and post Watergate, um, there was always somebody denigrating Saudi Arabia or accusing it of one thing or another. This time around, I was sat there watching it, and I must tell you, by this audience, as I told you and others, I enjoy watching American elections. <laughs> Not simply because of, the, of, of what they are, and they are really a, a tremendous exercise in, 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 in verbal gymnastics and, and, and other, other just uh, amazing talents. It's like watching a Bollywood movie. You have the whole gamut of emotion and, and action and music and uh, stabbing in the back and uh, bowing down and, you know, everything is in there. And this goes on for four years. <laughs> I, I'll bet you from now, well, Mr. Trump can't run again, but I'm sure his vice president is already looking to four years from now of presenting himself and he's already preparing the, the you know, so it, it's wonderful to be in America and to see this exercise in how people reach decisions and so on. And I will add another thing that I said in some of my meetings here. I'm gratified that the American political system has proven itself to be so resilient and so strong that this election has passed without any undue friction or doubt or any, any inclination of an acceptability to one side or the other. Mm -hmm. And this was not the case in the, in the last election. Yeah. So that is something I think that is a sign of, of how strong the institutions are that you enjoy here. Your Highness, for, first of all, thank you for that. Uh, very rousing endorsement of American institutions. I know a lot of people, no, I say that very seriously because I know a lot of people, particularly on this campus, may be feeling disheartened about the result because their favored candidate didn't win. But I think the prince is redirecting our attention to uh, a, a deeper source of uh, uh, comfort uh, at what happened, and that is the durability uh, of the institutions and the peaceful transfer of power. But your highness uh, did not really answer my question about whether the Trump administration coming in increases the likelihood that Saudi Arabia will get things like the ironclad security guarantee and the nuclear program. I, I, I take it from your comment that you're optimistic, and so I'd like to ask a follow-on question, which is, okay, Saudi Arabia, inshallah, will get these great things from the United States of America. What does the United States of America get in return for giving your country a security guarantee, a nuclear program, et cetera? In terms of, of, of diplomacy and politics, like Mr. Trump got on his first visit to Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia collected 57 leaders of 57 Islamic countries to hear Mr. Trump give his speech in Riyadh. So they can just fill a room for him? Is that the, Absolutely. That's, that's what he gets? That, no, that's just, as I told you, yeah. in terms of diplomacy and, yes. and, and political action for a country like the United States that wants to have, um, and it has the leadership role in, in the world. So that's one aspect. The other aspect, of course, Saudi Arabia, through its Vision 2030 and its transition from the, uh, the fossil fuels to a more um, a combination of, of uh, energy sources, uh, from different uh, energy energy capabilities, uh, will be able to work with uh, with uh, with the United States on economic help for for the whole world. Mm. Um, the Saudi aid program, uh, according to UN statistics, which the UN, by the way, in in its statistics, it requires or asks countries to contribute to uh, aid to other countries. Uh, a percentage of 0.04 percent, I think, if I'm not mistaken, from their GDP mm. to uh, to help uh, in aid programs. 
the kingdom contributes so over the past 50 years, I would say, since we began to get the, the oil wealth that we have, 4.0%. Uh, mm. So it is the highest contributor percentage-wise of GDP to aid programs, not only through United Nations aid agencies, but through its own uh, arms of, of aid that it gives through the Islamic Development Bank, through the Saudi Industrial Fund, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in terms of economic terms, the United States and Saudi Arabia working together can improve the lot of a lot of poor people around the world. Yeah. That's the other thing. The other aspect that we can have with you is in security matters against uh, terrorism. That's been an ongoing Saudi-American uh, uh, cooperation uh, forever. And when I was in the intelligence business, for example, I remember um, in 1997 or 96, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there was a joint committee. Uh, John Deutsch is here, and I think he can vouch for what we and the South and the the American CIA were doing together against terrorist activity and and other um, common interests in there. So there is a that factor. Uh, to be uh, in it as well. And the general um, uh, well-being of, 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 of world uh, activity. But do we not get those things if we don't give Saudi Arabia a security guarantee? Well, uh, no, I would say that we will not get Saudi uh, American uh, uh, security guarantees if we didn't provide these things. So, so, you know, how reliable do you think President Trump is going to be? Whenever I'm in Saudi Arabia and I ask people about the, the U.S.-Saudi relationship, I hear a lot of concern that the United States is not reliable, has not been a reliable ally. And people often bring up the September uh, uh, drone strike against Aramco facility in Abqaiq, September 2019. That happened under Trump. Yes. Well, I'm not saying that he will be more reliable now, but that's why the kingdom is entering into this discussion with the United States in order for us to be mutually reliable yeah. and not simply the U.S. reliable to Saudi Arabia. But also I want us in Saudi Arabia to be equally committed yeah. to come to the aid of the United States should it need so, as it did without agreement in the past. So, Your Royal Highness, to close out this portion of our conversation about the U.S.-Saudi relationship, I think it's impossible to talk about Saudi Arabia's relationship with the United States without uh, talking about the uh, murder of your uh, former uh, colleague, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, in 2018, which has been a real uh, a stressor on the relationship between this country and uh, Your Highness's country. Um, you know, this is a, a, a murder that was uh, allegedly at the behest of your country's leadership. And in fact, our own Central Intelligence Agency has uh, said that. So what are Americans' misunderstanding about that episode? One thing I think that Americans have not misunderstood, and if I may say the CIA as well, is that their conclusion was reached through um, uh, presumption and uh, suspicion and uh, uh, deciphering uh, what they consider to be inclinations on the part of the leadership to be in control of every action that takes place uh, uh, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And I would contend that there is absolutely no proof of that other than the contention or the suspicion or the supposition that uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman ordered the killing of uh, Jamal Khashoggi. The other thing I think that Americans perhaps don't know about is that the perpetrators of that crime have all been tried and are in jail. Every one of them uh, who have participated in that crime are in jail at the moment. And uh, the other thing, of course, that you may not know is that Jamal Khashoggi, some Jamal Khashoggi worked with me as my press spokesman in the embassy in London and then subsequently in, in, uh, in Washington. So I, I personally feel uh, uh, a personal grievance at uh, his killing and at his uh, murder, the way that, uh, that he was murdered uh, by, by, by whom? By fellow Saudis. And that is to me uh, as heinous a crime as can happen anywhere. But I would also add to that 
that rogue elements in governments are not unique to Saudi Arabia. And there have been other incidents uh, around the world, um, including in this country, uh, where rogue elements took things under their own um, uh, decision and uh, did things that would reflect badly on the leadership. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anybody can, can, can blame President Bush, for example, George W. Bush, for what happened in Abu Ghraib uh, in, in, in Iraq. And I have seen no blame being put on President Bush or his then Secretary of Defense. Or I've even seen a lot of blame, yeah. Well, but yeah. What, what has it done? Yeah, there was no CIA estimate that said Mr. Bush gave the order. Right, right. Of course. Nobody thinks that. Yeah. Yes, so, yes. Understood. And so these are things, I think, that... Whoever knows Saudi Arabia also, it is out of the, 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 the psyche of, of, of any Saudi government institution uh, to undertake uh, such, a, such a crime. So, Your, Your, Your Royal Highness, I am probably not going to be get, able to get out of this room alive unless we turn it over for questions. So I'll just ask two short questions on, on uh, the internal reforms, and then we'll open it up to our audience. And we have the room until 6.30. You'll so, ask short questions in order to get me give him a very long answer. Yeah. So, so, so Your Highness, uh, you know, I, I, the, the reforms in Saudi Arabia are nothing short of momentous. I grew up in Saudi Arabia. The country is almost unrecognizable from when, it, uh, when I grew up there and unrecognizable in ways that are almost entirely good. Um, but do you ever worry that the pace of change is too rapid, that Saudi Arabia is losing its distinctiveness, that Saudi culture and Saudi groundedness and its particular uh, a practice of Islam is being traded for participation in a kind of unmoored global culture that is the same in Singapore, Dubai, or downtown Boston? My view is that hopefully the, the, um, the, the, the moral composition of, of Saudi culture uh, itself by the country opening up to the rest of the world as it has done will be also impactful on our visitors as it is uh, on our citizens. Uh, when you see, when they see how Saudis live, how they re receive others, mm. uh, the, the, the friendliness. I have a few of my friends here who've been to Saudi Arabia, and I wish they would come up and speak for, for it. Uh, I am prejudiced in when I speak in this. Uh, my, one of my colleague uh, mates uh, from, from uh, Georgetown, two of them actually are here with us. I don't know if there are others as well, uh, have been to the kingdom, and uh, they can tell you better than I can uh, what Saudi Arabia is and, and, and the, the, the distinct uh, um, uh, generosity and, and, and friendship and, and empathy that Saudis have for others who come uh, to, to enjoy other the sites or to do business or whatever you like. But this is an opportunity for me to tell you all uh, that you are welcome to come to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, and now, alhamdulillah, after many years of of uh, restrictions on, on visitors from abroad, you can go online and get a visa in five minutes. And so please take advantage of that and come and see for yourself. Don't believe what I tell you. And uh, what I've seen from those who have come and left the kingdom, um, you told me that the students you took to Saudi Arabia last year. Uh, and, they want to work can, there. Yeah, <laughs> they all want to work there. Why? Because they saw something that was attractive to them. So I don't think reform is going to dilute our, our substance, if you like, or our essence as a people or, or as a culture. But I, but I hope that it will also reciprocally um, allow others to be affected But what we would consider to be um, uh, a better uh, way to conduct their lives in their daily lives. The the economic reforms, the social reforms that have been happening in Saudi Arabia are absolutely momentous. I, I've heard the crown prince and others in the Saudi leadership talking about how these reforms are aimed at remaking the Saudi citizen and turning them into a more empowered person who thinks critically. Um, when you have people who are empowered and thinking critically, um, you know, 
how far, how long will it be until the economic and social reforms are also coupled with political reforms to create a political system for, that is that can absorb these empowered and critical thinking people? Well, we are an evolving country like all countries are. Yeah. And I think the, the citizenry are the ones who are responsible for how they will approach that. Uh, and it's not going to be a matter of a top-down um, uh, decree uh, on what to, to, to do that, but rather um, an, inter, uh, uh, an integration of, of the, the sense of what the people want and what the, the leadership can provide them. And uh, there is a very um, classical uh, Arabic uh, uh, saying attributed um, to uh, the Khalifa Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, who followed the four principal uh, caliphs of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was asked about how he dealt with the people. Yeah. Is this Sha'arat uh, Muawiyah? Uh, Sha'arat Muawiyah, which is the, the, the hair of Muawiyah. He said, there is a hair that is held on both sides by me and by the people. If the people pull, I give in. If they let loose, I pull. And, and it is that kind of, of... I never let it break. I never let break, yes. That was uh, the, the end of it. Um, and, and in the kingdom, the, 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 the relationship and, and the institution, if you like, of the public majlis. The majlis is the audience that the king and the crown prince give to the public uh, on a weekly basis, where any citizen from Saudi Arabia can come and address whatever grievance, whatever opinion, or something like that that he wants from, from the king and so on. Uh, and that is a, a practice that is very much part and parcel of the makeup of, of the uh, DNA system of the Saudi leadership. Uh, whether there's going to be more political reform, I cannot say. But my hope is that this hair that is linked between the leadership and the people will never break. Uh, and, and therefore, the reform will come when the people want it to come. Yeah. I've always felt the leadership of this university needs to read about <laughs> Shah Rukh Mahalia. So we are now uh, going to open it up for questions. We have two microphones at either ends of the room. And so if you would please uh, queue up at the microphone. Um, this microphone is very lonely, so I would love to see some people queuing up at it, and I would love for there to be some gender diversity in the questioners, which is not happening yet. Okay, so let me, I will start here with my colleague, Professor Erez Manella, please. Thank you very much. Uh, brief question. Uh, how concerned is Saudi leadership uh, about Iran and particularly about the Iranian nuclear program? And what does the Saudi leadership, what would it like to see in terms of the policies of the new incoming administration toward Iran? Excellent. You want me to answer this? Or yes. Collect let's, questions. Uh, would you like me to collect questions? It's up to you. But why don't we answer that question? Because okay. that's something I should have asked, but of okay. course, Eras asked it. Okay. Well, uh, we've gone through our ups and downs with Iran since the Iranian Revolution, uh, started in 1979. Uh, when Khomeini came to power, he wanted to bring down all of the so-called uh, monarchic regimes in 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 the area. Uh, after he successfully brought down the monarchy in uh, in Iran. And we went through a tense period of relationship between us, culminating in the break of relationship when the Khomeini uh, instigated uh, the pilgrims that come to Mecca every year from, from Iran uh, to, uh, to attack the Holy Mosque in order to take it over uh, in 19, I think, 84 or 85. Uh, I may be mistaken by a year or two there. Uh, and that led to the break in, in the relationship. Um, uh, subsequent to that, there was uh, a, uh, an effort to, to improve the relationship begun by the uh, then uh, president of, uh, of Iran, uh, Khatami, uh, not Khatami, Rafsanjani, uh, who uh, met with uh, our crown prince at the time, and uh, they uh, reached uh, an agreement to improve the relationship. Uh, 
he left office. Uh, be, uh, the, it was the last year of his uh, term, uh, and uh, the, the diplomatic uh, uh, relations were restored. Uh, and uh, his successor, uh, Muhammad Khatimi, uh, actually expanded upon Rastanjani's engagement with Saudi Arabia. Uh, I would call it the, the then honeymoon between Saudi Arabia and, uh, and uh, Iran. But that's a honeymoon that's long over, and now... I have to give you the sequence in order to come to what we do now. <laughs> um, um, to make the story sh uh, short, um, that unfortunately began to turn sour uh, at the end of the Ahmadinejad regime. When Rouhani, uh, um, also we went through the, the Khobar uh, Towers uh, explosion that was instigated by what was then called the Hezbollah in the Hijaz, modeled after the Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, Saudi citizens adhering to the Khomeini philosophy, uh, exploding uh, uh, car bomb in front of uh, towers housing American office, uh, American military personnel in 1996. Um, uh, the, uh, but there was an, uh, an agreement reached between Saudi Arabia at the time, a security agreement where both countries agreed not to interfere in the affairs of the other and to try to uh, not allow anybody to affect their relationship. Jump to uh, 2017, I think, where uh, the kingdom uh, uh, executed uh, a Shia rabble rouser who called for the uh, revolution against Saudi Arabia was Nimr tried. Nimr al hmm? Nimr. 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 Yeah. Uh, Nimr. Abdullah Nimr. Uh, he uh, was tried and, 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 and sentenced and executed, and huge crowds of Iranians were allowed to attack the Saudi embassy in, in uh, Tehran and the Saudi consulate in uh, Mashhad, um, which led to the break in the relationship. Um, Post-COVID, uh, um, the Iraqis, the present Iraqi government, or previous Iraqi government, began to uh, try to mediate between the kingdom and Iran at the request of Iran. And uh, after uh, two or three years of such negotiations that were also uh, done in Oman, which was also uh, mediating and still is mediating between the U.S. and Iran, um, uh, Saudi Arabia and, and, and Iran agreed to uh, reestablish diplomatic relations uh, and for the agreement to be signed in Beijing. Yes. And why Beijing? It's because it has good relations with both sides. Yeah. Uh, and basically, I would call it uh, that uh, it is a kind of referee uh, between both sides, where e each side can go to the Chinese and say, look what the other side is doing, they're not adhering, etc. So this is where, since that time, two years ago, I think two and a half years ago, we've had diplomatic relations with Iran. My personal view is that uh, Iran is still short of implementing the agreement that was reached between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, particularly on the issue of interference in the affairs of others. Uh, because we still see uh, Iran interfering in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Palestine, in Syria, in, in Iraq, uh, even as far away as, as, as you know, other places like uh, Pakistan, etc. Uh, so um, that is still a work in progress. But uh, we have diplomatic relations. We have received Iranian pilgrims over the years uh, since the, the, the previous time. Uh, but nothing more than that. And I think both sides are still tentative in how far they're willing to go in, uh, in bringing the relationship closer. Your other question was about? I, I think that was his question. Okay. I, I mean, there's a lot more, but I have okay. uh, people who will subject me to bodily injury unless I call on them. So at this point, we will collect two questions. We'll take two questions, and then we will have your highness's answer, and then we'll be forced to close. So... Uh, uh, my colleague here, and then my colleague uh, here, please. Hi, and please much. be succinct in your question, because I know you. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
thank you very much uh, for coming here, Israel Aine. Uh, my name is Roy schwartz Tichon. I'm a Master of Public Policy student. I'm coming from Israel. I could ask you 25 questions. I, he <laughs> sent me 25 questions. <laughs> um, uh, but I will uh, make one short invitation and one short uh, question. I agreed with many things you said. Some I, I disagreed. I'm hard of hearing, so you have I, to clear. I have agreed with many things you said. With some I disagreed, but you are so nice, so I assume I didn't hear you well. Um, my first question, I would so much like to visit Saudi Arabia. Uh, I assume you would like to visit Israel. Can I invite you to Israel? Um, and my second question is, you referred to that in the answer you just gave. Um, there have been four countries that fell or partially fell under Iranian influence. I mean, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. Um, what Saudi can uh, make to bring back them to Saudi sphere and more specifically, Syria specifically? Well, you're, you're, right. you're going to take another We'll question. take one more question. Thank you for that question. Please. Hi, I'm Rasha Muslah. Um, I'm a fellow at Car Center here at HKS. I'm specialized in human rights and humanitarian work. My question, can you hear me? Get closer to the mic. Yeah. Okay, I'll just take it out. Yes. <laughs> so um, you got a question today, and I'm sure this is not the first time you get it, which is why don't Saudi Arabia and other countries come in and govern Gaza? And I guess this might be replicated in the West Bank, and then we have Palestine under the Arab world, I guess. This question, unfortunately, um, is like shows how Palestinians are usually deprived of, first of all, that they are, their identity is ignored, that their right for self-governance, their, so, their right for self-determination is basically ignored usually. And this is not something that only Palestinians face because Arabs in general, general are usually lumped together, especially in the American society, in media and others, as if we're, we're one entity. And this is part of the discrimination, bigotry and others that we face here. My question to you is, how do you think, what's the role that Saudi Arabia can have in changing this rhetoric here in the US? Especially that we're seeing this rhetoric also in politics now where Trump would come up and just call Palestinians as a slur. So we are, there are this track of um, discrimination against Arabs and Muslims has become so mainstream. And I think a political, fact, a political pressure needs to be undertaken in this case. Do you think that Saudi Arabia can help in this? Thank you for that question. You'll have to... Clear it to me. I, I didn't so so uh, her question was twofold. First of all, she objected to the question I asked you, which was about why isn't Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries ready to come into Gaza to help post-conflict governance, to stand up a Palestinian government. Uh, 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 she, she is saying that that question reveals a, a denigration of Palestinians and a denial of Palestinian agency which she believes is part of a broader anti-Palestinian racism right. and her and as evidenced by President Trump's use at one point of the term Palestinian as a slur when he said Biden's a Palestinian and so she is asking what can Saudi Arabia do to correct that uh, 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 anti-Palestinian racism right. so okay. fair then the first question. You have the to... first question he invited you to Israel, and his question was, "What can Saudi Arabia do to wrest Syria, Yemen, Iraq, and Lebanon from the Iranian orbit and bring it back into the Arab world and in the Saudi orbit?" Well, we're, we're trying through diplomacy and through uh, economic engagement with these countries in order uh, to show them that there is another way of doing things than simply being so totally aligned with, uh, with, uh, with Iran. Um, the difficulty there, of course, is that in, in these countries, uh, Iran also depends on non-state actors that they have recruited and, and in many cases even imported uh, into countries like Syria, for example. They brought uh, um, militias from not just from Iraq, but also from as far away as Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, into Syria. Um, uh, in, in Syria, particularly uh, with the other uh, Arab League countries, we've re-established uh, relations with, uh, with the regime, and an embassy was recently reopened in, uh, in Damascus. And hopefully through that contact, not just with the leadership, but with the people of Syria, that uh, the effects of the uh, Iranian presence 
can be challenged, if not, you know, uh, downgraded, uh, if possible. And the same is true in Yemen. The kingdom now is, is in talking terms with the Houthis, who were at one time uh, uh, lobbing uh, missiles at Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia was bombing them, etc. But we've reached uh, um, uh, some kind of ceasefire with them, uh, alongside the, uh, the Israeli legitimate government, uh, the uh, Yemeni legitimate government. Uh, the irony there, of course, is that while Mr. Biden, when he came to power, and he objected to us undertaking military action in Yemen, it is now Mr. Biden who is taking military action in Yemen uh, against the, uh, the Houthis. Um, uh, the same I can say for, for the uh, uh, Iraq. Um, there has been, um, uh, since uh, uh, three or four prime ministers uh, ago in, in Iraq, a growing uh, engagement between uh, Saudi Arabia and, and Iraq uh, that is attested to by the former president of, of Iraq here, Barham Saleh, who himself was, in my view, the one who opened the door for the rapprochement between the kingdom and, uh, and Iraq when he was president. Um, so th those are the efforts that Saudi Arabia is trying to, to engage in. Um, as far as, as the... I agree with you, Yanni. Uh, it is the Palestinian people who should decide what happens in Palestine. Um, the, uh, the, the, the observation there is that the institutions in Palestine um, need to be uh, upgraded, in my view. Uh, not only the, in, well, in Gaza now, there are no institutions because of the Israeli attack. But in, in the West Bank, you have the Palestinian Authority, which needs to think of itself in terms of we have to reform how we do things and to recapture the support of the Palestinian people that has been eroded uh, throughout the year uh, and now uh, is, is mostly... Um, very ephemeral, if I might say, uh, in the West Bank. Uh, but uh, I'm not an expert on Palestine, and you probably are from Palestinian origin, I assume. So you, you're probably more able to tell me uh, what uh, the Palestinians need than me telling you what you need. So, Your, Your Royal mm -hmm. Highness, we are now uh, at the end of our time, and so all that is left for me to do is, first of all, to thank our audience, uh, to thank those who ask questions. Uh, thank you for coming. I want to thank most profoundly you, Your Royal Highness, for honoring us thank with you. your presence here. I believe everybody here would sign on to my belief that we have just spent the last 90 minutes in communion, not just with a first-rate mind, but also with somebody who has an extraordinary heart. Thank you. And so thank you, Your Royal Highness, and thank we you. hope you will come back to Harvard often. Thank you. Thank you. May I, may I say something before I leave you, um, especially for those of you who are students uh, in, in Harvard, um, and that's not to exclude the non-students, but uh, there is a program that the King Faisal Center um, uh, established called Gateway KSA. Uh, it is online. Uh, you can uh, look it up and you can uh, apply to be a candidate for a visit to Saudi Arabia that would last about 10 days and be joined by other students from other countries um, for a tour of the kingdom and engagement in discussions and uh, culinary marvels of Saudi Arabia, uh, as well as uh, discussions with your peers and with government officials and so on. So please look it up and, and sign up and come and visit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Highness. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.